Hi class, today we're talking about chapter nine, reporting. Now reporting is going to cover a little more in-depth information about different topics as well as some interviewing follow-up information that you may remember from the previous interviewing chapter. Now, first of all, report as defined by Merriam-Webster has several definitions. The primary one, of course, that most of us know is it being a news report or a written account. So a reporter is usually a person who reports news. Now, of course, report also has a few other definitions, one of which is a rumor. So any common talk or anything spread around town Part of a reporter's job is, of course, listening to what people in their particular area are saying and check into it and see if something actually is news that needs to be reported. And of course, a report is also an explosive noise. Whenever you go hunting and you shoot a gun, you'll hear a report. That's the noise that you hear after the action happens. So a report is whenever you're, if you think about how that explosive noise is happening after this big action, think about that in the context of news. News is generally something new or unusual, important comings and goings in a community. So you want to, as a reporter, Make sure that you are that you are providing that additional information for the people who want to know what's going on. They'll either they've heard about something before or there's something important happening. You're covering it and pushing it out there for everyone to hear or see. And of course, Reporting is giving an account or making a record or summary of information. And also you can account for oneself. And that is also a report. Think about with opinion pieces. A lot of times, not only is the person offering a summary of information, they are also offering their own account or their own information in addition to the, the other part, maybe offering their own conclusions about a particular topic and uh, potentially offering some insight. Now, of course, there are lots of different types of, of news stories. Usually we'll have event coverage or features, or you'll have a localization of a national or international story, which can be direct, indirect, or have a microcosm of this particular event. You can, whenever you're looking at events, of course, you have planned events and unplanned events. We'll mainly talk about those today. Features generally are going to be more evergreen. It'll be a, dis a profile on a person maybe. Sometimes if a person has passed away, like with Colin Powell, they'll have obituaries written for them. A lot of those, they'll collect information about important, important people over the years and a news desk will have this file folder ready to go whenever an older person in public office or in entertainment or some other public capacity uh, dies. Now, you can also cover places, of course, or annual events. All of those are different types of feature stories. Now for event coverage, and whenever you have a planned event, usually they send you some kind of media release. It'll help you understand what's happening. Now, whether or not you cover it is a different story. Usually, if you're working on a news desk, you have to go through all of these press releases, figure out whether or not this is actually important to your target audience. 
Some examples of different types of planned events would be speeches or meetings or even news conferences. News conferences are generally something where you may have a, a speaker who is going to offer some additional information. And all of the media outlets involved in a coverage area are usually invited to those events. Now, as for meetings, meetings generally, if you're working in a, at a local news station, you'll look at school board meetings or city council meetings. Sometimes you'll have something on the, on the state level, but generally speaking, it's going to be a city or parish council meeting or a school board meeting. Both of them offer agendas ahead of time. They are required by law to include information about the meeting online. So it's, it's pretty easy usually to figure out what's going to happen and do a little bit of background research before you go. Now, unplanned events are normally some kind of breaking news. This could be a hurricane or maybe if there's some kind of crime spree happening in an area, that would be a, an unplanned event. Any sort of man-made disasters, if there's a, a power plant that has, has an issue, that would be a breaking news unplanned event. Or now, of course, with those, sometimes you will have speeches or, or news conferences with unplanned events. Generally speaking, there will be, you'll have a reporter or someone at the scene ahead of those planned portions in an unplanned event, but you'll have communication between a news team in, in the building along with people who are at the scene of whatever it is that's happening. And there are normally public relations officials or public information officers who will be able to provide additional information about what's happening. Um, like if there's suddenly a new lead in a missing persons case, they'll normally have a public information officer in whatever area, if they're out like in a field or something, who will be able to offer additional information. If um, there can even be something, unplanned events can even include something kind of simple like a travel related coverage. If there's a traffic jam on I-10, that's an unplanned event that relates to the community and people usually want to know about those kinds of things. Around the holidays, a semi-unplanned event is usually when there are serious airline delays. If you know a, a machine breaks down in TSA and suddenly they have to they have to work by actually opening everyone's bags then that usually causes a huge traffic delay. Those kinds of things also count as unplanned breaking news events. Now, when you're preparing for events, you're, whether it's planned or unplanned, usually you do need to go and search for some background information. If you're going to an opening for a new store, you might receive a media release or a press release related to the new opening. A lot of times if it's if it's something like that, they'll the company will put a an embargo on the information. So they don't they'll release it ahead of time so the reporters or the news staff can prepare the information. However, and they can get more more coverage if they're going to have, let's say, the CEO or someone appear at the event but they don't want to they don't want to mention it before whatever date the event's happening or maybe a day before the event is going to happen so that way they can kind of keep it under wraps or if you're if you're going to a city parish council meeting you'll want to do some some back look up 
background information, review the agenda, see if anyone speaking maybe is up for re-election, if they have a, what kind of voting history do they have for these kinds of bills, if there's a bill proposal, or any other kind of related history happening with the event. Now, once you look through all of your background information, you want to develop a story shell. If you go on page 149, there is some additional information about shelling a story, but basically what happens is you're writing something very similar to what you did whenever you created your outlines. You're figuring out what the main points are and writing as much as you can without actually attending the meeting. That way, when you're finished, you're able to modify what you have. Maybe the thing you thought was going to be super important isn't as important as you thought. You can delete some things, add some more based on your notes from the meeting, include a few direct and, and paraphrased uh, quotes or bits of information, and then you're ready to go and you don't need that much additional time after the meeting to, to turn the story, which is a huge help, especially if let's say the meeting's at five and you have to put this on TV by six. Now, the biggest question to ask when you're looking at covering an event is why is this important? Is this something my target audience would want to know? If so, look at it, figure out what the key elements are, ask who, what, when, where, why, how, figure out what the most important part of those questions, what the most important answers are, and use your inverted pyramid to organize your information into your shell story. Now, Whenever we talk about outside the lines information, that's if anything unexpected happens. If someone, let's say, starts a protest at a meeting, or if there's some sort of unexpected announcement, those are outside the line items. Occasionally, if it's, a, if it's an event where protesters already knew it was going to happen, a lot of times they'll release their own information to the media to say, hey, we're going to be here for this thing. And so you might have a couple of pre-meeting stories showing different sides of the argument for or against whatever it is that's happening. And of course, after you finish an event, you want to have some kind of there will almost definitely be a post-event interview. This might be at the podium if we're talking to the governor or if you're talking to, a, to the city parish president. The public relations officials will normally handle additional questions, possibly in an interview area or interview rooms, or they might even come to a news organizations, TV station, like go to the TV station or go to the newspaper area. But most of the time they'll stay wherever the event happened and kind of have somewhat individual meetings with different groups of news media people. Now, you don't just want to have the people who organize the event talking. You do want to use additional sources. Look for any possible person on the street interviews. So people who's, who may have relevant opinions about something, like if they're against an, or for an overpass that's happening in their neighborhood, or if there are other, other people, maybe other professional people who might have opposing views to the one presented by the by the meeting. And of course, what you want to do is check facts, check yourself, and check everyone else. This is part of why you do background information. You look for background information before you attend a meeting and you want to review your own notes and the 
any, try to clarify anything that you didn't quite understand from the meeting or from the press event. So if you're talking about a, like a new COVID-19 restriction, maybe you want to discuss it with a healthcare professional to see what it is, whether or not whatever is being discussed is reasonable, or if maybe a protester's point of view may or may not be valid because of certain reasons. You want to make sure that you understand what it is the um, what it is that happened in the meeting and what the what the officials are really saying. Now, one of the things with meetings is you do follow a particular agenda procedure, and you can figure out what all of these things mean in Robert's Rules of Order. The majority of both business and government meetings follow this rule book of parliamentary procedure. So they'll talk about seconding a motion in a meeting or what it means whenever they call to order, why they handle new, new business at a certain time and handle things that were on the agenda at a different point or when or how a new agenda item might be added at the last minute. And of course, whenever you attend any kind of event, you want to make sure that you get contact information for the important people. Make sure you have information so you can call and ask follow-up questions or send an email. It's almost always going to be a spokesperson who will give you this contact information, but this person might not be the official who spoke at the meeting. Like if you, if a police chief is the person who spoke at a meeting, the public information officer is the person you will normally contact about any, with any additional questions you have. Now in beat reporting, there are lots of different topics people can cover, different places, but in general, you can break them down into three main parts. That would be thematic, geographic, and conceptual. Now thematic, if, you, if your target audience is really into higher education or maybe business news, that would be a theme you would follow or maybe they're into entertainment, or if you have a, if you want to kind of narrow it down geographically, it could be local entertainment, like a city, city entertainers who, if you have a place like Austin, or you might look at sports. If you want to report sports for a particular university or if maybe you're only doing college sports or maybe just college football, those are different themes a beat reporter could follow. Now, even though all three of these can overlap, the you can also end up with a geographic beat by itself. So let's say you're supposed to cover the city of Opelousas. Well, it doesn't just mean covering government stuff. It also means maybe seeing what's happening in different neighborhoods. Are there some changes happening in the city? Or maybe there was something at one of the school board meetings or, you know, they have a lot of, of different things you can cover under the geographic umbrella. And of course, we also have conceptual beats this is normally going to be investigative reporting or maybe multicultural issues reporting. Uh, NPR actually added a bunch of multicultural issues uh, reporters to their staff recently. So they have a lot more of that kind of content coming out. Or for investigative reports, you'll see Usually, if it's kind of um, 
long-term crime or maybe they'll look at the way at a, a trend in a particular school or you know or in a parish school board or something they'll investigative reporting can vary depending on your news department so it's definitely something where you want to talk to your news director and see what it just kind of generally what they what they want from you and of course this brings us to covering a beat Whenever you first start covering a beat, you want to interview your supervisor and also the person who was there before you. What kind of events were they covering for the past however many years they were there? Which stories did were they working on that still need one or two more interviews before they're published? Are there any, any other ideas that they, they had, but they know aren't going to work in whatever their new role is. And so they want to recommend them to you and maybe say, hey, like follow up with the sugarcane farmers because they had something big coming up in a couple of weeks. You know, usually whoever your predecessor is will be able to point you in the right direction. And of course, you do want to review previous editions of either the newspaper where you're working or any TV or radio broadcasts, see what they did in the past. And that'll give you a general idea of where you want to go with it in the future, either because you want, you liked some of the things they were doing or because you didn't like certain things and you want to see if maybe you can steer the position into a slightly different direction. Now, writing timetables are also very important. This is one of those questions you need to ask your boss whenever you start covering a beat. Figure out if you're going to need day of turns. That means like figuring out what your story is and having your sources and everything pretty much ready to go so you're able to finish your story within to get your story accepted have your interviews and write everything and either have it in a five or six o'clock newscast or the, um, or, you know, the next day's newspaper or online or wherever you're publishing every day. That's a very different feel than if you need to have a longer form piece where you're spending days, weeks, sometimes even months working on something and probably working on several stories at once. So that way they can publish something while you're working on a longer term story. Now, when you begin your beat, you want to make in-person introductions it's a little harder right now while we still have COVID restrictions and everything, but if you think about it, whenever someone calls you or emails you out of the blue, how often are you really going to respond well to them, especially if it's someone that you might think is a little annoying because they're constantly bothering you for information that you may or may not want to give. So go in person, add a face to that annoying voice they're going to hear all the time on their, uh, on their phone or to all of the, um, the emails with constant questions about different events happening or in the area. And that way people will actually know who you are. And a lot of times you actually can build a rapport with them in the case of KATC, they had a person on the news desk who had great relationships with different people in the area. One of them actually was a, a sugarcane farmer who would always call him anytime they had anything that even remotely resembled news just to make sure that his buddy at the TV station knew what was happening. So that's the kind of relationship you want to build with people where you're able to talk to them. Maybe they have a favorite sports team or 
their, you know, you ask them about their kids and what have you, and you're able to develop a semi-personal, but still professional relationship where you are able to trust each other enough to answer each other's questions. Now, of course, some of the sources that you want to build would be people who are community leaders. And of course, you can also ask regular people. Sometimes whenever you have a Facebook account and you have three or four members of your community who constantly email you either with information or if they want to maybe um, say how awesome they thought your newscast was or something, then you're able to possibly get some more information about what's happening in the community and build those connections with even more people and cover inf- and cover stories that are actually important to your target audience. Now, of course, we don't just want to rely on, on people calling or us calling them. You want to also gather documents, look up trends that you see in certain areas. You can find annual budgets. You can find meeting notes online if you go to the Lafayette Consolidated Government website. You can go to any school board site as well and and find a backlog of previous meeting notes in addition to upcoming agendas. And of course, beat work is always about following up, making sure that you're staying in touch with people, calling them, even if they don't have anything for you, it's better to stay in touch and show them that you care. And then they'll, they're more likely to reach out to you whenever something important happens. And of course, most small towns and bigger ones now have their own websites and social media where they'll post information regularly. Maybe there's some kind of new festival they're sharing or some other thing that's happening and you didn't get the press release for it yet, but you found it online. That's the the kind of information you might find whenever you're checking websites or social media. And of course, you want to connect the dots. Make sure that you pay attention to what you're reporting and you'll be able to see if maybe there are multiple thefts all in the same area that and the police are looking for a certain, like a truck that was seen on a bunch of different security cameras during those thefts. That would be an example of a repeating story. Maybe you can find out why they're stealing copper pipes out of construction sites or why they're stealing certain car parts. I mean, are those parts in high demand right now? Where is it happening? What's going on? You know, it's that's one way to figure out when a story might relate to your audience. And of course, always ask questions, be that annoying person, ask them what's going on and keep asking and also make sure that you that you check any information you're given with at least one other source. 